welcome to the Sunshine Cathedral. We hope that you have enjoyed a wonderful holiday season. And as we enter this new year of 2015, we invite you to worship with us at the Sunshine Cathedral on Sundays at 9 and 1030 a.m. If you're in the Fort Lauderdale area, we are very easy to find. We invite you to worship with us in person. But if you're worshiping with us via the website, we say many blessings to you and hope that you will have an opportunity to visit our campus soon. But now, as we enter this new year of 2015, join us now for the exciting worship here at the Sunshine Cathedral. First reading this morning is from the wisdom of William L. Fisher. Jesus Christ showed all of us that we each have direct access to God. He did not walk across the land saying, look what I, as the Son of God, can do. Rather, he walked among the people, telling them, in effect, here is what you, as a child of God, can do. He told us, of our true estate. We are reflections of God Almighty. And in these human words, God's voice is heard. Our second reading is a reading from the Gospel according to Luke. Two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped, their faces downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? Jesus asked, what things? They said to him, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But he was handed over to be sentenced to death, and he was crucified. We had hoped he was the one who would rescue our homeland. All these things happened three days ago. But there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he is alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. When they came to Emmaus, Jesus acted as if he was going on ahead. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us. It's nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. 
after he took his seat at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Well, today is the third Sunday of Eastertide, and so we continue to hear resurrection narratives. Today's story from Luke's Gospel is an Easter Sunday story. It happens on the, uh, the event that we call Easter. It, it happened uh, that day. The people are walking from Jerusalem uh, on that Sunday. So the crucifixion has happened on Friday. They're walking back to their home on Emmaus on Easter day. These two disciples uh, are, are new to us. We don't really hear about them before this story, and we don't hear about them again. And yet these two new disciples, these disciples that aren't as familiar to us as some of the others, are walking home to Emmaus when they encounter the Christ light shining through a stranger they meet on the way. So often if we let ourselves, we experience something divine in a stranger that we just happen to meet on the way. The story isn't really repeated in the Bible, though some want it to be. It's such a good story. It's such a powerful story. We want to think it's one of those that pop up a few times, but it really doesn't. Some people will try to make uh, the character of Cleopas, or as we used to say in Arkansas growing up, Cleopas, uh, that we wanted Cleopas to, to be not just this one and done figure. And so there's a character in John's gospel who has a similar name. It's not the same name, but it's similar. And so uh, some people wanted that to be the same person, but it ain't. So um, we, this, is, this really is just a unique story about Cleopas and an unnamed companion walking home to Emmaus from Jerusalem on Easter. The Cleopas story of Cleopas and his companion returning to Emmaus from, Jerusalem, Emmaus from Jerusalem, it's only shared in Luke some six to nine decades after Jesus' crucifixion. So not only is it a unique story, but it comes to us late in the tradition. Jesus himself would have never heard this story. Still, this Johnny-come-lately and unrepeated narrative sticks with us. Why is that? Why is it such a compelling story to have come so late in the tradition, to only show up once, to, to have two figures we don't hear from again, one of whom isn't even named? How is this story one that we all know? If you said the road to Emmaus, some bits of that story would have flashed into your mind if you've been uh, in church at all over your lifetime. Well, I think the reason it is such a powerful story for us is because it is so multi-layered. You could take so many directions with it. You could discover so many points from it. So much is packed into this one narrative. It's almost like Luke knew. Okay, these are characters who I've not talked about. No one else has talked about them. Uh, in fact, I may even be making them up. Uh, I've got to put a lot into this story because it is a one and done story. So today we're going to briefly explore some of the many levels uh, that this story offers. In fact, when I was preparing uh, to discuss this story today, I came up with no less than seven, originally, seven things to talk about. And then as I was uh, continuing to prepare, I came up with a couple more. So there were nine, nine things, nine whole sermons we could get from this. But you're getting a break today. I'm only going to give you four. Four <laughs> of the nine. So I'm saving some for later, but you're getting four whole sermons for the price of one. Four whole sermons. So cancel your brunch plans. <laughs> Put your bladder on lockdown. We're going to be here for a while. <laughs> Sermon number one. We must know ourselves because not everyone really knows us. Not everyone really knows us. And it's not because we haven't tried to tell them who we are. It's not because we've been hiding. It's not because uh, we, we, we were hiding. I remember when I went to the trouble of coming out when I was 19. It was clearly a perfunctory uh, action, you know. <laughs> 
And I just felt like you know, it would feel good to say it out loud. Surely anyone paying attention since the time I was walking could have figured it out, right? Uh, my, my, my little bronze baby shoes were pumps, for God's sake. I mean, what? <laughs> And still, people acted surprised when I told them, right? We have to know ourselves because not everyone really knows us. Cleopas and his companion are identified as disciples. These, these people are students of Jesus. They are followers of Jesus. They are friends of Jesus. They've spent a lot of time with Jesus. They know him, or they should. They say they do. But when he shows up in a context beyond their expectation, they don't recognize him. He's not where he's supposed to be in their imagination. He doesn't look the way they want him to look. He's not identifying the way they want him to identify. They don't know him. They know who he, they want him to be. And when that's not how he presents, they don't recognize him at all. And it might actually even be worse than that. A church leader named Eusebius lived just 200 years after Jesus. He was a bishop in the young church and a historian of the young movement. And he claimed to have met a grandchild of one of the apostles, I believe the apostle Jude. He met a, a grandson of one of the apostles, although everybody was making those kinds of you know, claims. Everybody had, you know, had, had, had uh, washed the cup that Jesus uh, drank out of. Everyone had, had found a, a breadcrumb that was left over from the Last Supper. Uh, everyone had found a splinter from the true cross. Though if all the splinters added together, you'd have a forest and not just one cross. But anyway, everyone were making claims in the early days. And Eusebius' claim was that he had met a grandson of one of the original apostles. Well, in any case, Eusebius, from his research, determined that Cleopas, from our story today, was actually the brother of Joseph of Nazareth. That would make Cleopas Jesus's uncle. Now, I am not sure that Joseph was an actual person. I, I believe he was probably a literary invention based on Joseph the Dreamer in the book of Genesis. But for that matter, I don't know that Cleopas was an actual person. So imaginary Cleopas could have imaginary uh, uh, Joseph as his brother. It makes sense for imaginary families to stick together. In any case, within the story, Cleopas is a disciple. Cleopas is a follower. Cleopas is a student, Cleopas is a neighbor, Cleopas may even be a relative of Jesus. He represents someone who should know Jesus very well, but he may only know what he wants Jesus to be, what he assumes Jesus to be, what he what he thinks Jesus ought to be. Perhaps he doesn't really know Jesus very well at all. Maybe he's never listened to Jesus tell him who he is. He's just putting on to Jesus what he thinks he ought to be. How else could he not recognize him on the road to Emmaus? Cleopas and his unnamed companion had hoped, the story tells us, they had hoped that Jesus was going to be an armed rebel to raise an army and set up a revolutionary government. And they were disappointed that that's not what happened at all, not nearly even though Jesus never said that was his plan. They had cast Jesus in the role they wanted him to play, and then they were disappointed when Jesus turned out to be something other than what they had imagined him to be. Does that sound familiar? Has anyone had a story like that in your own lives? We are often disappointed when we try to decide who others should be, rather than listening to them tell us who they are. There is legislation in about 26 states right now telling people who they should be, who they should love, who they should marry, how they should exist. And instead of hearing those people tell them who they are, they just keep telling them who they ought to be, who they should be. They're not listening to the people's experiences. They are trying to enforce their own vision onto these lives. LBGT folk know what it is like to be marginalized because we didn't turn out to be who others thought we should be. 
How many of us had that sweet church lady say, I want you to go out with my granddaughter, my niece. Just, just take her out for a Coke. I think you'd really like her. Sadly, they never said that to any of the women in the room. They were saying that to, men, to, to young boys. And, and I remember every time that conversation came, how I just froze with terror. Like, don't you got a grandson? <laughs> People see what they want to see instead of listening to what people are telling them that is their truth. Families that abandon their queer children, they don't really know them. They don't see the divine light within them. Politicians who demonize the poor, they don't really know them. They don't know how hard they work. They don't know how they sacrifice for their children. They don't know how they deserve so much more than circumstances have offered them. If they knew how hard people work just to be poor, they wouldn't try to cut their pension in old age. They wouldn't try to deny them health insurance. They wouldn't try to deny them food services. They would try to offer them more, but they don't know them. They don't know what it's like to be them. Churches that insist that women can't be called the ministry don't really know them. They don't know that women, like men, are made in God's image and that the lack of a Y chromosome doesn't prevent one from serving the people of God. War hawks who are always wanting to bomb or invade countries, countries filled with grandmothers, countries filled with babies, Countries filled with religiously devout people. Countries filled with people who love their families. Countries filled with teachers and nurses and doctors, people who help and heal their neighbors. They don't see their so-called enemies as humans. They don't know that all people are children of God. We will never see what is good about others if we insist that they fit into our preconceived ideas, our prejudices, our expectations. Cleopas probably had told Jesus dozens of times that he loved him, but in reality, he never really knew him. He never really saw him for who he was. He loved what he wanted Jesus to be instead of getting to know who Jesus was and embracing that. He couldn't even recognize him when he showed up in a way that differed from his expectations. Sermon number two. We have to look up to see miracles. Cleopas and his traveling pal are downcast. When Jesus come up and say, where are you going? What are you doing? What are you talking about? It says that they were looking down. They were downcast. When they are looking down, they can't recognize the opportunities and possibilities before them. Like Hagar in the wilderness, we don't find the miracle until we look up. Do you remember Hagar? She was, she was uh, Abraham, she worked for Abraham and Sarah and they used her as a surrogate mother and so that they could have a child. But then when they didn't need her anymore, when Sarah finally got pregnant, then they discharged her. They just threw her out, her and her baby, threw her out into the wilderness. It was unfair. It was unjust. And the story says that in the wilderness, Hagar is afraid that she and her baby will starve or they'll die of thirst. They're going to perish in the desert. And so she just puts her baby in a little shaded area and she sits down to cry, just waiting for death to come. She's focused on what is terrible, on what is wrong, what is unfair. And she is stuck in that pain. It's not until she looks up, until she broadens her perspective, that she sees there's a well in the wilderness. Yes, the wilderness is terrible. And yes, it's unfair that she has been left there. But even in the wilderness, there is opportunity. There is hope. And so she looks up and there's a well in the wilderness. Just like Hagar, these people are looking down. And so they don't see what is beyond their pain. They don't see what is beyond their trouble. They don't see what is beyond their difficulty. While they were downcast, they were missing out on resurrection possibilities. A resurrection experience is happening right in front of them. It's happening for them. It's happening to them. And they don't even know it. They're too focused on what is wrong. They're too focused on what is miserable. They're too focused on what is broken. They have forgotten to look up to see what is possible, to see what good lies ahead, to see what opportunities for healing exist beyond their disappointment. 
Until they look up, they can't be lifted up. Until they look up, they can't have their own resurrection experience. Without looking up, they'll miss out on the miracles that are available to them. Sermon number three. It's time to notice and name the other in our midst. We have an unfortunate and long history of trying to silence and ignore and erase people that make us uncomfortable, people who are different from us, people that we don't agree with or people that we don't understand. Since Cleopas is named in this story and his traveling companion is not, it's just Cleopas and Pal. Cleopas and the other, Cleopas and someone else. Since Cleopas is named and the traveling companion isn't, it is reasonable to assume that his companion is a woman. In the Bible, the unnamed figures are often, most often, women. It's always Lot and his wife. It's always uh, it, it's all, it, and if the woman is named, it's either because she is specially favored or because she's a bad girl. <laughs> we know the names of the bad girls. But if they weren't super saintly or super bad, it's just a person or a woman or a mother or a wife. It's just somebody standing around. So since Cleopas is named and the other one isn't, we probably know that the, the other is a woman. Maybe it's Mrs. Cleopas, Cleopas' wife. But in any case, there is a woman disciple right there in the story, equal to walking with Cleopas, experiencing the resurrection, uh, mourning the death of her friend Jesus, and yet we overlook her. She's not even named. That mistake has been going on for far too long. Isn't it time to see the others on the journey with us, to recognize them, to name them, and to give them their credit? Isn't it time that we recognize, name, and value the other in our midst, the women, the children, the immigrants, the poor, the people with disabilities or diseases, same gender-loving folk, gender-nonconforming folk? Isn't it time that we notice and name the other? Sermon number four. Kindness is the true creed. Mr. and Mrs. Cleopas show biblical hospitality. They say, stay with us for evening is at hand and the day is past. They're reminding us of the story of Sodom and Gomorrah where there were strangers that came to the city and only one family in the whole area, in both towns, only one family offered them hospitality. They were going to have to sleep on the dangerous streets if it weren't for this one family that took them in. Now, unfortunately, it was the most dysfunctional family in the history of families. <laughs> but nevertheless, they showed kindness to strangers, not so much to their daughters, but whatever. <laughs> and so here is Cleopas and Mrs. Cleopas showing kindness to a stranger, saying it's late, we're tired, you must be hungry, eat with us, stay with us, share our food with us. It is kindness, not dogma, that opens Cleopas and Cleopet to a life-changing miracle. We're gonna find a, a good name for her. Rather than using dogma to exclude, vilify, shame, control, or punish people we don't understand or like, the road to Emmaus story reminds us that the greatest commandment is to love. And the better part of spiritual living is treating others the way we would like to be treated. That divine love is unconditional and all-inclusive. The road to Emmaus story would suggest that it is ridiculous to try to disqualify otherwise qualified people from adopting children who need homes. Why are we trying to exclude good parents? Why are we trying to exclude children from having good homes? Because the parents love each other and they just happen to share a gender identity? That's not how anyone would want to be treated. That isn't hospitable, that isn't welcoming, that isn't loving. And when we use religion as our excuse for these reprehensible prejudices, we are misusing religion and clearly not reading the very Bible that Tennessee and Arkansas want to idolize in state laws. Wow. 
Jesus became a very controversial figure by sharing table fellowship with people beyond his social group, people who didn't look like him, people who weren't from where he was from, people who didn't worship the way he worshiped, people that, that his religious community might have even called sinful and even had some Bible verses to make their case. And yet Jesus would sit down and share meals with them, and love them, and touch them, and see their innate wholeness. When the Cleopas family invite Jesus to share their table, that's when they experience the Christ nature. It isn't when they're debating theology. It isn't when they're arguing over dogma or doctrine or tradition. It isn't when they participate in some ritualized sacrament. It is when they said, you look hungry, have some of my food, that they experience the Christ nature. Sharing, inclusion, hospitality, compassion, these are divine qualities, and as we embrace them, we experience resurrection in our own lives. I doubt if today's story is literal history, but it is very true. Indeed, it offers a variety of truths for us to consider and apply to our lives. We must know ourselves because not everyone really knows us. We have to look up to see miracles. It's time to notice and name the other in our midst. And kindness is the true creed. Whichever of these sermons you embrace today, be assured it is the good news. Amen. Hello, I want to thank you for joining us for worship today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Again, if you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, please stop by and worship with us on Sundays at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to find out more about the Sunshine Cathedral, about our resources, or about our books published by our senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Darrell Watkins, or if you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, may God continue to richly bless you on your journey.